onto YouTube and then we shall get started. One moment. We have a bunch of other people coming in. Hi, Linda. Hi, Christopher. Nice to see you again. Uh, we've got Vicky coming on. And it looks like we are live on. A bunch of other people coming in. Hi, Linda. We are live on YouTube now. Okay, and we'll get started in just a moment. Hey, Marlene. Hey, Margarita. Hey, hey, Tonito. I see you're on, on YouTube, on uh, Instagram. All right, so let's go back over to Zoom here. And we have a couple other people coming on as well. So here's Lucy, since we had a couple people who asked to see her. Uh, hi, Dan, welcome. And we'll get started. Uh, I see Margarita. Okay, let's put Lucy down. All right, so I had a couple requests before I started, but tonight we're actually going to be talking about the wonderful world of mushrooms. And my goal for this evening really is to actually convince you that in order for you to be on a road of optimizing your health, you need to include mushrooms in some way. And I wanna make it crystal clear to everyone that I believe that you're sort of missing some really fundamental part of food in general, if you are not eating. <clears throat> Just making sure all my connections are good here. So that is my intention for tonight. Uh, I had a couple requests. One was actually that uh, I show Lucy. The other is to show what people, what, what I'm growing. So I, I mentioned in one of my lectures a couple of weeks ago about how it's important to grow, to be involved in growing some part of your food. So uh, this, and I grow things hydroponically. So this is what's called double cup method, which is basically where you feed hydroponic nutrients right to the roots. So no, no, uh, no watering to the soil, just to the bottom of the roots here uh, with a special nutrient. This is shiso. And uh, if you recall from last week, this uh, was incredibly small. Um, and then we have what's called the Kratky method, which, and this is a type of Japanese lettuce called komatsuna. And if you recall from last time, there was hardly any leaves on this. It's growing quite well. And then uh, before we get started, the last thing is, you know, you can actually regrow a lot of vegetables that you buy at the supermarket. And one of them um, is green onion. So this green onion, remarkably, um, do you see those little green sprouts coming in there? That's just from yesterday. So it's grown you know, that much since yesterday. And in a week, I'll be able to trim this. It grows that fast. So you can see that on uh, Instagram. All right, well, I got a request for that. So I figured I would show, show you that. Hi, Cody. Hi, Keto Dessert Company. Hope you're uh, doing well this evening. All right, so let's get started. Let me share my screen. And let me blow it up here. If anyone has any questions, uh, like always, please do put them into the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them as we go through today, tonight's lecture. So my aim, as I said at the very beginning, is to convince you by the end of this lecture that mushrooms are critical for including in your diet an overall balanced diet. And the reason is, is because when we think about organic material, food, we think about, generally speaking, we think about um, minerals, we think of animals, we think of vegetables. But mushrooms are neither a plant nor an animal. And they compose such an incredible wide diversity of types of variety and just in bulk volume that essentially, if you're not including them, you're missing out on a whole aspect of the, the wild natural world. And we'll talk about why in the West, there is sort of what we call mycophobia, you know, a fear of mushrooms and how we can sort of get past that because that sort of mycophobia doesn't exist 
in the East. It's certainly not in China or Japan or anywhere else for that matter. So let's start talking about what mushrooms are. So first of all, they're one of the largest kingdoms in nature and they vary in size. Some are the speck of a dust and others are the size of a whale, larger than a size of a whale. There's one, I think it's in Idaho, where there is a mycelia of, which are basically the filaments of mushrooms that, that cover, it's a huge, you know, it's like a mile of this huge mass underneath of the soil. And a lot of us don't realize that soil, if you go into the forest, is just loaded with mushrooms and loaded with mycelial networks where hey, you have all these filaments. And essentially mushrooms have a mycelium, which are sort of the, the filaments. And then when they pass, pop up in, from the ground that you, know, you see on a damp morning where the, the mushroom pops up out of nowhere, that's the fruiting body. And the fruiting body is basically an extension of the mycelium. So when you see a mushroom in the ground that sort of pops up, what you're seeing is the fruiting body of a large mass of, of, myce of a mycelial network that's underneath of the ground. So the mushrooms there, you just aren't seeing it. So these mushrooms, they have survived all the mass extin extinctions on the planet. They are really, uh, as you'll see as we go through this, really remarkable types of this sort of a remark, they, they behave in such remarkable ways and in such a wide diversity of ways that it's really incredible. And I hope you get that sort of same excitement. And of course, I'm not a mushroom expert by any stretch of the imagination, but mushrooms actually have been of interest to me since I was a little kid. When I was probably six or seven, at least. My father, as you know, is also a doctor. And one of my father's patients had a mushroom farm. And it was one of those memories that just really stick into my head because I, my mother took me to this man's mushroom farm. And it was inside this sort of dark, wet warehouse. And it was for a kid at my age. And quite frankly, I think of any age that you would go into this particular type of mushroom factory, mushroom farm, with the wet, dark, uh, very unusual, and they were growing the white button mushrooms. And it was really a formative experience to me. It was one of those things my parents exposed me to so many different, you know, different things as, as I was growing up. And this is one of those things that sort of sticks in my mind. Another thing that sticks in my mind is that my mother would take me many times to Chinatown in Philadelphia. I grew up in South Jersey. And she, when I would wander around Chinatown, I would go into the Chinese grocery stores. And they always had the most unusual mushrooms that you wouldn't be able to see anywhere else. And, I, and when we would have food there, of course, we were eating all these different kinds of mushrooms and you would never see them anywhere else. And, you know, just when you think about it instinctively, thinking back, it really shows this sort of big dichotomy between how we see mushrooms in the West, in the United States specifically, since we're talking about that, and how people say, as an example in China, see, see that as well. So, um, so, I have sort of had this fascination with, with mushrooms since, since I was a little kid. There are entire subcultures of people who are really into mushrooms. They have mushroom festivals. There's one mushroom festival in Telluride, Colorado that is, has been around for many, many years. And you know they go on mushroom hunts where they walk into the woods and a scav a hunt for different mushrooms, wild mushrooms. And there are, of course, classes that you can take on how to identify wild mushrooms. Um, it's, and of course, along with that, you know, a lot of, there's a fair number of people who are interested in the psychedelic aspect of mushrooms, but there are people who are just really into mushrooms and they get involved in the whole gamut of culinary, medicinal, psychedelic, the whole, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. So they're neither plant nor animal. And as I said, when you see the cap of the mushroom, the fruiting body, there could be miles of fungal networks underneath the ground. And sometimes you can clear away the soil and you can see this mycelial network. 
And basically they eat the debris and they make soil and they move through the ground. They're constantly scavenging and moving around. There are basically three types, those that live off of fallen organic matter, those that live off of living wood. And in fact, you know, you can grow mushrooms at home and it's not something I've ever done, although it's, it's certainly, I was something I was looking into and still am, but you can buy certain logs that are already seeded with, with certain mushrooms and you can get multiple fruiting bodies to grow, to grow mushrooms. So there are mushroom growing kits. There's some people who use, you know, coffee grounds mixed with some other things to be to grow mushrooms at home. Um, so thinking about it in the context of types, however, there's those that live off fallen organic matter, those that live off of living wood, those that live off the fruit of trees. And we'll get into this sort of mycophobia where we think of mushrooms and we don't automatically instinctively think food. We think fungal infection, we think, um, you know, dark hidden places. A lot of these sorts of things are sort of programmed into our mind just from a cultural perspective. And as I said, one of the goals of tonight's talk is to convince you that that sort of cultural programming that we've sort of gotten living in, in the United States, we should get rid of because there's actually evidence and theor well, theories more than evidence, I guess, but it's certainly investigating that the, that the lack of a certain polysaccharide, which we'll get into a little bit later in the class, is partly responsible for why we're having trouble with our immune systems. And we'll get into that very shortly. So let's talk a little bit about the history of mushrooms and fungi. And then we'll get into um, a few other things like entheogens and human health, uh, how fungus is used in fermentation. And then of course, edible and medicinal mushrooms and how and why you should include them into your diet. So let's first start talking about the history of mushrooms. Let's close these down. So I don't know if you all recall, but I think it was probably in the 1990s, the Iceman was found in the mountains of Austria. 5,300 year old mummy that was frozen on the top of the Alps in Austria. And think about that, 5,300 years ago. You think about biblical history, Moses was uh, around, whoops, was around uh, 3,500 years ago. So we're talking about 5,300 years ago, and he was carrying a mushroom in a little medicinal pocket. Interestingly, he also had marks on his body that corresponded to acupuncture points, which means that there may have been some sort of primitive acupuncture type therapy that was being done. And we're talking 5,300 years ago. And in this, in this pocket, he had a medicinal mushroom that is, um, that is used for diarrhea. It's useful for diarrhea in that it causes the bowels to move a little bit faster to get rid of a poison that might be in the intestine. And so mushrooms, and this is in Europe, even way back then, 5,300 years ago, which is basically essentially before recorded, before any recorded history, uh, there was a history of using mushrooms as, as a medicine. But when we think about Western culture, however, it's very limited in terms of its comparison with Asia. Now, the, one of the reasons is, and because mushrooms have always been associated with medication, is that there's actually been a, a strong dichotomy in Western, med in Western culture in general between folk medicine and the Greek Roman medicine. And I, I can speak to that fairly deeply only because uh, it's something that's been of interest to me uh, in my medical career. One of which is there was a doctor by the name of Moses Maimonides who was in the 1200s, 1300s. Um, just checking here, I see there's a uh, question. Let me uh, hold on one second. Oops. Well, I'll have to get to that question a little. Oh, let's see here. Um, 
So Barbara uh, is asking, and we'll get into all of these, um, that her Ayurvedic doctor says mushrooms are not healthy for her gut and other practitioners say mushrooms are to be avoided for several different reasons. So I'll get into the, the, the answer to that uh, a little bit later. Please do uh, keep, keep asking your questions, however. So this dichotomy between um, folk medicine and Western medicine is something that is of interest to me because uh, I have studied a doctor by the name of Moses Maimonides from again, the 1200s or so. And this, he was um, a very famous philosopher, a Jewish philosopher, as well as a very famous doctor. He was the uh, court physician to, to, to uh, one of the um, uh, sultans in Egypt and very, very well known his, his recording of, of, of medicine. And he was, he, along with a whole host of, of doctors from that point onward, all sort of looked to ancient Greek medicine and ancient Roman medicine as really the, the pinnacle of, of sort of science and folk medicine, although it was somewhat incorporated, was considered to be somewhat separate and different. Whereas in Asia, there was no dichotomy between folk medicine and higher forms of medication, of, of medicine. So in Western Europe, there wasn't a huge history in the use of, of these things because of this sort of default thinking about Greek and Roman medicine. In terms of food, however, in Italy, Poland, and Eastern Europe, there was always a tradition of, of families going to find wild mushrooms to eat. And there was also a tradition of preserving which mushrooms were edible, which mushrooms were not. The difference, however, is that when industrialization happened, unfortunately, and people moved to the cities, what essentially was happening was, you know, you, you lost some of the knowledge of which mushrooms were edible, which mushrooms were poisonous. And as a result of that, the intake of mushrooms decreased and there was really not any interest in mushrooms. In fact, there's all kinds of writings from those particular times that basically spoke about mushrooms in a very, very negative way. Certain poets spoke about, you know, the dark corners that mushrooms are found. And there was a, essentially a, this phobia of, of mushrooms. Of course, this is further complicated by the fact that sometimes on grains, there was a mold that would grow that would cause uh, hallucinations. Some people think that the Salem witch trials were basically what happened during uh, in Salem, Massachusetts is that there was a researcher that looked back at what, at what potentially could have happened. With, and one of the theories is that there was, it was excessively warm that year. And they think that there was an ergot fungus that grew onto the grains and caused these young girls to start hallucinating, which then led to people thinking that they were witches. And this is one of the causes of the Salem, Salem witch trials. So when it comes to Western culture, unfortunately, there has been sort of a phobia of, of mushrooms. And that's unfortunate. And it's just a, it's a result of, of the culture that we're in and certain things that happen. But when you think about the bulk of organic matter on the planet that is edible, you know, fungus and mushrooms make a huge part of that. And to avoid eating that is really uh, to our detriment. So let's talk about mushrooms in China. As I said, there was no distinction between folk and higher medicine. So in, mush so in China, they were edible mushrooms. They were uh, the physicians of the time who were often monks, the mostly Taoist monks. They be were the repositories of knowledge for these things and they traveled widely. And on top of that, there was always an advancement of medical information in China. And even back then, there was a huge bureaucracy when there, was, uh, when there was a government, they had health officials and bureaus of health and they had records that they kept. There was, uh, when we think about China today, we think of a bureaucracy and a huge government. Well, this is not a new phenomenon actually. In China, in, in certain kingdoms of China, they had an enormous bureaucracy of the emperor and various levels where you had a huge bureaucracy and health departments 
that, you know, that certified people, there was, it's, it was really a remarkable thing that they had, but this was one of the things that caused them to preserve the knowledge of, of mushrooms and they advanced it and continue to advance this knowledge, not just for health, but for, for culinary purposes as well. In modern time, of course, we think of penicillin, which is from a fungus and there's a medicine called cyclosporin. That's a fungus as well. And modern medicine, and certainly is something that has been um, influenced greatly by, by fungus. So, uh, and this is gonna continue to grow as, as time goes by. Now there are certain stories in mushrooms that are, that are just too bizarre not to share. One of them is uh, slime mold, which is actually studied in the lab. And remarkably, slime mold uh, spreads out. And there was a really fascinating uh, study where they actually put the train, they, they took a map and they put, the, they put food where all the um, cities were. And they were able to determine the fastest route that you could create trains and such between these two, these, these things on the map. But the, the, the thing that was, was really interesting about the slime mold is that they were, uh, there were some Japanese researchers that were able to prove that a slime mold could navigate a maze to find food. And mushrooms, it's just one of these bizarre things, have sort of this uh, unusual behavior of somewhat, you could say, an intelligence where they're actually able to navigate a, a maze to find food. Cordyceps, which we'll get into because it has some benefits for, for human health, is another example of, and th these sort of, this particular story probably will make you somewhat fear a mushroom, but it's the, it, if this isn't out of science fiction, I don't know what anything is. Let me explain what cordyceps mushroom, how it, how it behaves and how it gets its spores to spread. Cordyceps finds an ant and it grows onto the it grows onto the ant and the ant is walking around and doesn't think anything's prob a problem and then all of a sudden the cordyceps penetrates into the brain of the ant and it starts to control the brain of the ant remarkably and it causes the ant to grow uh, call, crawl up to the highest tree it can find well, the high, crawl up a tree. And when it gets up to the top of the tree, the ant commands the, the fungus cordyceps, commands the ant to clasp onto the tree and not let go until the fungus grows, kills the ant and releases spores into the environment to complete its life cycle. That is gotta be one of the most peculiar stories in, in nature there is. And that's why I call it sort of the invasion of the body snatchers. Thankfully, um, there is no fungus that causes humans to do the same thing. But the fact that this sort of mushroom does this, that it can actually control the ant and cause it to do something is really, really bizarre and too strange of a story not to share. Mycorrhizal symbiosis, it's one of those things that people are not really aware of, but it's basically that fungus live among the roots and they are capable of interpenetrating into the roots and helping the, the, the plant to actually grow. And it's able to connect different plants with other plants and other fungi. And you get essentially a network, a living community of plants and mushrooms in, in a community that are all interacting and communicating with each other because the mushroom can send signals throughout the entire network to talk about where food is, where it isn't, share food from one area to another. And we don't even really realize the wonder that is underneath our feet when we're walking through the woods. There is this remarkable fungal network of communication that's happening and facilitating you know, the health of plants and trees it's really a miraculous thing. And it's just something that we're not really even conscious of. It's a really remarkable thing. And it's just something that I wanted to share because it's so remarkable and it's so 
interesting, and it's not something that we're really aware of that much. Now, Paul Stamets, who is a mushroom expert, and there are many mushroom experts out there, but Paul Stamets is certainly one of those guys that I've heard many lectures by him. Uh, he's been on all kinds of different podcasts, and he's one of these people that goes out and talks a great deal about mushrooms. And one of the statements he said is, habitats have immune systems like we do, but mushrooms are the bridges between the two. And when you start to understand the immune system and how the immune system is really um, so incredible and at the, at your, at affecting your immune system, we have to start to wonder, and many have for many years, that the absence of mushrooms from our diet is probably, our, in other words, we probably evolved in such a situation where our, our immune systems were probably primed to be getting these sorts of mushrooms on a regular basis. So, um, so that's important to understand and we'll get into that a little bit further as the lecture goes on. Microremediation. This is using muscles, mu muscles, using mushrooms to detoxify environments. And you can take an oil spill as an example. And all this is sort of happening. Lots of studies are being done where you can put a mushrooms on top, mushrooms on the bottom, and like an oil slick in the middle. And amazingly, they are able to, to detoxify an entire environment. And they are doing all kinds of studies on this to make it more widespread. And um, there's a lot of research going on this, but I think that it is possible, and certainly Paul Stamets is one of the biggest promoters of this, that mushrooms, I think he has a book called Mushrooms Can Save the World, where he talks about this at great length, about how mushrooms can be used to detoxify the environment. He also has a um, study that shows that he's been able to um, reverse the bee colony um, problems with, with incorporating some kind of, of mushroom or fungus into, into uh, beehives, all kinds of amazing things happening in that regard. Um, but before we get into the edible and medicinal mushrooms and why and how and which ones they are, it's worth just spending a brief moment to talk about entheogens. Now, entheogens are, the definition is a chemical substance, typically a plant origin that is ingested to produce a non-ordinary state of consciousness for religious or spiritual purposes. Uh, in the West, there isn't much history with you know, Judeo-Christian background of using psychedelics and that, that sort of thing. There are lots of theories regarding that that probably make up a, a whole host of, of deep discussions, but generally it's not something that is, has been used in, in the West. However, nowadays there has been a great deal of research on the psilocybin mushroom. The main part of this research has been in, at Johns Hopkins um, and I'm just going to briefly discuss it, um, but smoking cessation with psilocybin mushrooms. So they, they gave people psilocybin mushrooms. They had like a trip where the, this was all facilitated and 80% reported they were smoke free in six months. This was of course combined with, um, you know, with behavioral therapy and such, but 2.5 years later, 60% were still smoke free and traditional treatments yield a five to 20% success rate. So something was happening with sort of what was going on with, with this. And I, I think it's a pretty remarkable thing. I'm not suggesting um, this is certainly not ready for prime time in terms of, you know, I don't think next year you're going to be able to go to a center and, you know, take a psilocybin mushroom. Um, but it's so, certainly interesting and certainly something to, to, to be aware of. The next one, which I found really fascinating was that, and part of this was done between uh, New York and Baltimore, uh, again, Johns Hopkins, was the fear of death and psilocybin mushrooms. And uh, let me sh shrink this down a little bit here. And I'll just read what, uh, this was a Scientific American article said in research conducted um, by um, NYU, as well as 
uh, 80 patients with life-threatening cancer in Baltimore and New York City. They were given psilocybin mushroom in carefully monitored setting and in conjunction with limited psychological counseling. More than 33 quarters reported significant relief from depression and anxiety, improvements that remain during a follow-up survey conducted six months after taking the compound. Now, the question is raised, really, well, how is it that this, this depression was essentially an anxiety? The reason that it went down was because there was a loss of the fear of death in people who had treatment with psilocybin mushrooms. And that makes you think, I mean, what is it that, I mean, if you, if I were to talk to you personally and I said to you, you know, give me something that, tell me, tell me in a certain way how you can eliminate the fear of death. I know this is um, off, off topic slightly, but to me, it's really, really fascinating. And I wouldn't be able to give you an answer for that. But the doctors there, and of course, you know, medicine men and shamans and such can give you uh, reasons why these things do the things that we discuss. But in this case, uh, this is what the researchers said. It's not that everyone comes out of it, meaning the, the psychedelic trip, so to speak. It's not not that everyone comes out of it and says, oh, now I believe in life after death. That needn't be the case at all. But the psilocybin experience enables a sense of deeper meaning and an understanding that in the largest frame, everything is fine and that there's nothing to be fearful of. There is a buoyancy that comes out of that, which is quite remarkable. To see people who are so beaten down by illness and they start actually providing reassurance to the people who love them, telling them it's all okay and there is no need to worry. When a person, when a dying person can provide that type of clarity for their caretakers, even we researchers are left <coughs> with a sense of wonder. That is remarkable to me, that there is something going on when people have this experience that, as he says here, that they start to see things in a larger frame of mind, seeing things from, I guess you could say they feel like they see things from a higher perspective. Things are more in, uh, in context, I guess you could say. And the fact that this can happen to me is remarkable. And I thought it was something that you might find interesting as well. So I included it. And of course, psilocybin is a magic mushroom. I'm not recommending people go out and do any of these things. And in fact, generally speaking, I am very much against um, uh, in this, the recreational use of this. And for quite some time, my feeling on the subject was that if you are going to use some kind of substance to alter your consciousness, it should probably be done in the context of the culture that cultivated it. Meaning that, you know, if, if you had decided that you wanted to do this in, in some way, you should do it respecting the traditions of the cultures that, that have done it over the years because they know how to handle it. They know how to cultivate the experience, that sort of thing, if that's something that, that you are doing. People who just sort of do this without any preparation, it, I think it disrespects the culture that, that you know, cultivated this experience, um, as well as I just think it's a dangerous, dangerous thing for, for people to do. It appears that through the work, I believe his name is Matthew Johnson at Johns Hopkins, basically they've been able to figure, not figure out, but they've been able to work with, with this sort of thing for some time now. And they've been able to create a, an environment and a situation that sort of uh, respects the experience and guides people and such. And for people who are terminally ill or uh, for PTSD, there have been some studies as well. Anyway, I find it all very interesting. And it certainly, certainly is something to keep, keep, um, you know, paying attention to the science as it comes out, because now at least the, the um, you know, the mystique or the, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, the, what's the word where, uh, you know, people don't want to touch psychedelics, you know, it comes with all kinds of negative connotations and that sort of thing. That's sort of breaking down as, as real mainstream research is starting to take, take onto it. 
anyway, I don't want to get too far into that. That's probably worth an entire lecture on itself. So let's get into general human health. And basically, it, the fungi, um, and this is where we get into the fact that I think we really need to consider the fact that these polysaccharides, which we'll talk about in just a moment, need to be in our diet for there to be an optimal immune reaction response in your body. Now, polysaccharides, we've spoken about polysaccharides in our fiber lecture. And yes, it's true that fiber, that mushrooms have a great deal of fiber and they're also very low in calories. Uh, the polysaccharides here, um, and so they're great for weight loss, very, very great for weight loss um, because of that, because they're low in, um, because they're low in, in calories, high in, poly, in, in nutrients as well. But polysaccharides are basically chains of essentially of, of like glucose molecules. And in plants, you have uh, cellulose and the type of glu it's called a beta glucan. And in, in plants, you have a one to four beta glucan. And in mushrooms, you have something called a one to three beta glucan. And the, this one, four, one, three is basically the position of a certain part of the molecule of the molecule at a certain position on the on the, uh, the ring. So um, interestingly, so plants have cellulose and mushrooms have what's called mainly focusing on this one to three um, beta glucan. I hope you can hear me. I'm getting a signal on my computer that my internet connection is weak. So hopefully uh, there's been no interruption there. So this one to three beta glucan is really where the magic is, is happening. This is a huge molecule. And when the immune system sees it, it actually almost reacts as if it was like a foreign bacteria. This is, this is how it stimulates the immune system, but it stimulates the immune system in such a way that it's beneficial to your health because after all, there is no bacteria. It's just stimulating this, this response. That's how it stimulates your immune system. And it sort of keeps your immune system like on the ready. That's certainly what, what's happening. And when you are, it's theorized that the loss of this in Western diets is part of the immune dysfunction we're seeing. And I would ask you all to consider, because this is what's being thought of by some people, that the loss of this is that, that we evolved in such a way that we need this 1,3-beta-glucan to be able to have an optimized immune system. To me, that's another one of those, these remarkable things about mushrooms. And that means that we should be including mushrooms in some way in our diet to get this immunostimulatory effect so that you have a great immune system. Next week, we'll actually be talking about what happens as your immune system ages and what's actually going on there. And certainly mushrooms play, play a big role in making sure that the immune system is, is optimized. And you get rid of this 1,3-beta-glucan and you're just not primed and ready to go like you would be in terms of, of, your, uh, of your immune system. The second thing they have, which is called terpenoids. Uh, terpenoids, which are found in a whole host of things, and we'll be talking about them in two weeks, actually. In two weeks, I'm going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system. Now, uh, first of all, terpenoids, which, as I said, are found in, in uh, mushrooms as well as um, things like lavender and um, and a whole host of things, but I don't want to get too far off track. They are anti-inflammatory. Terpenoids, it's called that way because it's sort of in a, a um, you know, like turpentine. It has sort of a, an odor and um, that's how the terpenoids came, the word came about, but they have an anti-inflammatory effect and they are very calming to, to the body um, and they interact with the endocannabinoid system which we'll be talking about in two weeks. And the important thing to realize right now is that we should be, we should understand that this endocannabinoid system is, has been called the endocannabinoid system only because the studies were done using cannabis. 
That's why it's called that. It's activated by a whole host of other chemicals. And that's gonna be what I'm gonna be talking about in two weeks that we shouldn't get too far off track when we see the word cannabinoid and think that somehow we're talking about cannabis. Yes, cannabis does like CBD does interact with the endocannabinoid system, but it has nothing to do with the fact that it's called the endocannabinoid system. This endocannabinoid system occurs throughout our entire body. And I remember when I first learned about it, I thought to myself, you know, someone, uh, some lecture I was attending, the guy was saying that, you know, we have this <clears throat> endocannabinoid system throughout our entire body. And I was thinking to myself, why would the human body have the, a receptor for cannabis throughout the entire body? It didn't make any sense to me. Like somehow we, we need cannabis. The truth is, is that it's only been called that because one of the things that activates it is called cannabis. It was the first thing that was studied and therefore it was called the endocannabinoid system. But there are lots of other things that activate it, one of them being terpenoids. Um, so as I said, we'll get into that in a completely other lecture, but they're found in mushrooms as well. Um, and so therefore you're gonna get an anti-inflammatory effect. Some people think that um, there are certain mushrooms that can help with autoimmune disease, which may be a result of, of the terpenoids that are in, in mushrooms. But generally speaking, the big thing is this 1,3-beta-glucan and its immunostimulatory effect. And you know what's really remarkable is that this 1,3-beta-glucan, which is this huge molecule, such it's so huge on a sort of molecular scale, that when you look at these things, you know, they're, and you look at sort of the simulations of what these molecules look like, they are incredibly complex, meaning they have all these things that are folding in and out of each other. And it's very difficult for science, for, for scientists, because of all this different protein folding and complexity of this molecule to really have, to really study exactly how it's working. So the science of this is going to progress much, much deeper as time goes by. And it's gonna be very, very interesting. Okay, so let's get into, um, let's get quick, we'll quickly talk about fungus in fermentation and then we'll get into the, the fungus. Dan is asking how often should we eat mushrooms to receive all their continuous benefits? Many doctors recommend that you should be having mushrooms every day. And um, one of them who I greatly respect, who I've mentioned in other lectures is Dr. Joel Furman who has his uh, G bombs analogy, which is G is greens, bombs, uh, berries, um, uh, greens, let's see, greens, beans, onions, um, mushrooms, berries, and, se and seeds. And that you should get all of those every day. And I think that would be fabulous. And we've spoken about in previous lectures, Dan, that we wanna get into our diet as much diversity as we possibly can because of all, not just because of all the benefits, but, but because we know historically speaking that the human of, you know, the Paleolithic times ate an enormous amount of different plants and, and, you know, like 80 or 60, whatever different, I mean, I don't know the exact number, but a huge variety of different plants. And we've spoken about this sort of law of families which is where you know you think about mushroom, you think about um, vegetables, and you look at them in terms of families. I don't want to get too far into that, but um, but we want to sample from different families. And if we're going to be doing that, then I think mushrooms certainly could be, um, you know, valuable. So, um, but fungus is also used in fermentation. Uh, Roquefort cheese has a fungus called penicillium. Um, it's it's also um, has a bacteria in it as well. Koji, which is fungus on rice, is the fundamental basis of Japanese cuisine. Miso, sake, natto, um, also breaks, it's great for marinades. And tempeh as well is a, is a fungal fermentation. Um, okay, let's talk about fungus. Mushrooms that you can eat. Okay, so this is Agaricus uh, bisporus is basically the mushroom that we see at the store. And these are uh, button the white button mushrooms, baby bellas, portobellas, cremini, they're all the same family. As I said, we're, they're basically the same mushroom. And 
truth be told, as I said, we want to sample from different types of mushrooms. So if you eat button mushrooms and portobello mushrooms, just like the same thing I've mentioned when you're eating from the same family of say cruciferous vegetables, just kale, collards, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, mustard greens. If you're eating one and then you eat, eat, eat another in the same family, you're basically getting sort of the same thing. And you're not getting the diversity of sampling between different families. So this mushroom, which is the most common mushroom in, in the West, contains carcinog carcinogenic compounds. So they need to be cooked. And I grew up actually eating them raw. Um, and, um, but the truth is, is that they, pro they most likely should be cooked. Uh, one of the mushroom experts, his name's Gary Linkolf, doesn't even recommend that people eat these mushrooms at all. He feels like they are, are actually tumorigenic, believe it or not, meaning that they, they can cause tumors in, in certain studies. So I don't, I, you know, I think if you're cooking them, fine, they're not nearly as beneficial as the ones that we're going to be talking about. So I would focus on, you know, don't be boring. I mean, <laughs> I put that here because we, we've all probably had button mushrooms, um, but they're boring. And they're, you know, I, I put in that these are sort of Europe, European and North American mushrooms. Um, we should probably avoid those if we can. And mainly not because I believe they're carcinogenic, but because the others are so much more flavorful and better for you as well. Uh, Enoki mushrooms can basically be found now at, at most stores. And Dr. Andrew Weil, many of you know Dr. Andrew Weil, speaks a lot about enoki mushrooms because um, in the Nagano region of Japan, where they grow enoki mushrooms, has one of the lowest incident, incidences of cancer in, in Japan and therefore in, in all the world. And most of it is attributed to the fact that uh, enokis are grown here and enokis are the people who live in that area eat a great deal of enoki mushrooms. The value of enoki mushrooms is really, they are, they don't really have that much flavor. They're great in soup and stews and um, you, they could be sauteed as well. They are high in fiber. Of course, as I said, they, as we know, they, they are probably very potently anti-cancer and they're very easy to use. They're not strong flavored and they can really be blended. They can be used in dishes in a very, very easy way. Next is shiitake mushrooms, also readily available. Um, and um, it actually encourages tissues to absorb cholesterol and therefore lowers cholesterol in the blood and is a hundred times more uh, potent at stimulating the immune system than, than the agorism. Uh, agaricus that we spoke of, the white butt, button mushroom. And shiitake mushrooms can, be, can also be found pretty readily. You can go to uh, Asian grocery stores and get them dried. And when you, I think a lot of people tend to get a little weirded out by dried mushrooms. Remarkably, when you rehydrate them, they taste remarkable. Um, they really do. It's, they taste fresh sometimes, depending on the quality. But you can get dried shiitake mushrooms for a very inexpensive cost in a pretty big package. Um, but stores like Whole Foods, is, you can get fresh shiitake mushrooms as well. I tend to use uh, dried shiitake mushrooms and, and find them to be incredibly, incredibly tasty. We spoke about cordyceps. Um, that was the body snatcher, the ant body snatcher fungus that we spoke about earlier. It's been shown to improve athletic performance and it's been great to improve just uh, weakness. General weakness has been shown in elderly people to help with uh, just improve your, your strength in, in, in a sense. Uh, you can make a tea out of it. You can buy a, um, a powder and make a tea out of it, but you can also throw it in soups and stews. Maitake mushrooms, one of my favorites, and it is a very meaty mushroom. It's, it's a very big, uh, big mushroom actually, and it's very meaty. It's, it's a big brown mushroom. Uh, you can lightly saute it and you can chop it up and it, it has sort of a very meaty, meaty flavor. The supplement is, 
is is fairly popular for people with um, for I actually happen to to take a, a, um, a supplement of my taki, um, but I also eat eat it. But I, I have actually my taki mushroom supplement here that I take um, for immune function. Most of this research, was, uh, at least for this, was was done was done in Japan. Um, reishi mushrooms, which is medicinal only, it's sort of a very woody mushroom, but is one of these mushrooms that is in incredible um, adaptogen, which basically means you know if you're tired, it can give you a little energy. If you're overactive, it can sort of calm you down. Um, it's mixed into a lot of different things now. I actually have right now a cacao that has uh, some reishi mushrooms mixed into it, but you can make your own, you can buy reishi and make your own tincture. I actually make a tincture of reishi. Uh, I, I get a bottle of gin, believe it or not, and you can put in reishi mushrooms because as I spoke about earlier, the terpenoids, so we have polysaccharides and we have terpenoids. The terpenoids are actually soluble in alcohol, which basically means that you can make a medicinal alcohol tincture with reishi mushrooms, which is what I do. I put it in there. And this was recommended to me by a very good friend of mine who is a traditional Chinese medicine doctor. And I had gotten a big thing of, uh, of reishi mushrooms. I didn't really know what to do with it. She said, do you have any alcohol at home? I said, yeah, a bottle of gin. So you can put a little bit of the, you can put the, these woody reishi mushrooms into the gin. It soaks, it gets all those terpenoids that we spoke about here to dissolve into the alcohol. And this was used in traditional Chinese medicine. And you just take a little, like a little tiny bit of it and you get all the benefits of these terpenoids that again, we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks um, by, by doing that. So you, there's the water soluble components, which is one benefit, but also the alcohol soluble um, ones as well. Then there's lion's mane. <clears throat> lion's mane is another mushroom that has also become fairly popular of, of late because it actually stimulate, stimulates nerve growth even in the brain and therefore uh, has been shown to improve cognition. And I've actually tested this all myself. I bought lion's mane from a company. It was mixed with mocha and it was like a breakfast drink. And remarkably, um, Remarkably, it actually caused me to have nightmares, believe it or not, strangely enough. So it was definitely affecting my brain in some way, um, but I don't take it anymore. And a, a matsutake, which is a pine mushroom. And this is prized in Japan. Uh, every fall, I believe it is, the matsutake mushrooms grow and it's used in all kinds of things in Japanese cuisine. And when I lived in Los Angeles, and I've been to Japan during this time as well. It's a very uh, fragrant mushroom. Some people don't like it, some people do. And it is, um, it's only one time a year. It's very, very expensive, but there was a, actually a Japanese restaurant that I used to go to in, in Los Angeles that during that season would actually serve matsutake in all different kinds of dishes. And uh, I really enjoyed that. So those are the mushrooms to keep an eye out for. Um, I just would want to stress again that you know if you're going to be eating one of these, you want to branch out. You don't want to stick to button, baby bella, portobello, criminy um, at all. And actually, speaking of something that just occurred to me, I was listening to a, an interview by Paul Stamets many, maybe a year ago, and he was talking about. He was on at the, the person, it was the Joe Rogan podcast, actually. And um, he was talking about, he asked him about portobello mushrooms. And Paul Stamets actually said something really peculiar. He said, um, I can't comment on portobello mushrooms because if I did, if I told you what I know, um, I would be the subject of many lawsuits. And then he wouldn't say any more. Um, that was very, very peculiar uh, for him to say such a thing. And I just think that uh, these mushrooms, uh, just if you don't eat them regularly, and if you're going to eat them, make sure you cook them good, cook them really, really good. And like I said, I think that the best thing you can do 
is to focus on the ones that have solid, solid, solid history happening with them and try enoki mushrooms, try shiitake mushrooms, try maitake, I love maitake mushrooms. Um, and try these and try them in different dishes. Sometimes just sauteing them in a little bit of butter or olive oil is incredible. I mean, my mouth is watering just thinking about just a little bit of butter with, with uh, sauteed mushrooms, the two go, go hand in hand. Of course, I didn't speak about like truffles. I didn't speak about um, uh, moral mushrooms, all, the, all these types of other mushrooms. There's so many that you, you can think about. I tend to think of these only because I know them a lot more than some of the others. And I, I've read some of the research as time has gone by um, and find them to be Inoki, shiitake, maitake to be very, very edible, very delicious, um, and something you should include in your diet. Now, if you wanted to take a supplement, um, there's lots of ways of taking these, these supplements. And in fact, sometimes the supplements are a lot more potent from a medicinal perspective because they're often made from, not from the fruiting body. Remember at the beginning, we spoke about how a fungus has like this mycelial mat of filaments and then up pops the, the mushroom. Um, when they make the, usually when they make the supplements that have all the one, three beta glucan and all that, all those beneficial ingredients, they're actually usually making it from the mycelium. And therefore you're getting a lot, you're getting a sort of a concentrated, more of a concentrated benefit from a health perspective. But regardless, you're still getting an enormous benefit. As I, I said, you know, it stimulates the immune system 100 shiitake a hundred times more than the common mushroom. And, and it, it just tastes better. It has a lot more use in cooking. And um, I think you should focus on those particular types of things. So let's get back to uh, question questions here. So Dan is asking when taking mushrooms as a supplement, um, can you take them indefinitely or should you take breaks? Depends on what you're taking them for. I've had a lot of patients with a history of cancer and there are certain mushrooms like the maitake mushroom specifically that has been shown to reduce the incidence of, of uh, metastasis, of spreading of, of tumors. And for those people, you know, they, they probably will take that for the rest of their, their life. There are other mushrooms that I haven't mentioned like shaga mushrooms, which actually have, are are uh, this very, very black mushroom that um, some people say is, has been helpful for people with a history of uh, metastatic melanoma. Um, same, re same thing, you know, if, if you're using it for that, this shaga mushroom, which you can make into a, a tea, probably can be used indefinitely. Um, I think, uh, getting back to what I spoke about, Dan, regarding this 1,3-beta-glucan, and the fact that probably we evolved to have this as part of our diet, I think that I would continue taking it because it's continually going to provide a little bit of, of useful immune stimulation that it probably is required for optimal human immune systems. That's sort of my, my feeling. So I don't think that you, um, that you need to take a break if you're using them for, for that purpose. When it comes to Things like lion's mane and where and reishi, you know, where you're using um, it for maybe as a nootropic. A nootropic is basically, um, you know, something to help with cognition. You know, maybe maybe you take breaks or maybe maybe not. It's hard to say. So Pat is asking, my talking mushrooms capsules or drops. Well, when it comes to maitake mushrooms, uh, the, the, the main source of the benefits is something called the defraction. And the defraction uh, was is isolated by a Japanese um, researcher on maitake. I, I happened to, um, this, this company, Mushroom Wisdom, that, that uh, I've, I've met the people at this company and had a chance to speak to them actually because about the original Japanese uh, researcher. And this is the most potent fraction of, of the maitake mushroom. And you can take it as capsules or drops. I believe I got this as a free sample at, at one of the food shows uh, 
that that I went to as a result of being uh, president of Miracle Noodle. You get to thankfully meet a lot of these people. But I started taking my taki as a um, supplement, the defraction, uh, as a capsule many years ago. Now I got this, and it's just easy. You put six drops in, and you know, doesn't really have much of a taste. I think it's dissolved in glycerin. Uh, yeah, and. Um, very good uh, company, Mushroom Wisdom. There's several very good companies. Uh, uh, let me hide my screen. Hold on. Let me stop sharing my screen. And let's see here. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, Mushroom Wisdom. Um, Paul Stamets has a company by the name of Host Defense. And they also, they also have, have that, have uh, lots of different supplements as well. So getting back to Barbara's question about her doctor, her Ayurvedic doctor who said that mushrooms are not healthy for her gut. Well, sometimes people do have trouble with certain fibers in, in their diet. So, um, so that could be one thing. And then of course, depending on what he's treating you for, there could be some, I don't know, issue with the immune stimulation. I'm not really exactly sure, um, you know, what that, what's, what's happening with that recommendation. All right. Well, we came up to the hour and I just wanted to um, briefly say that again, my aim for tonight's lecture was to give you a sense of the wonder of these mushrooms and how remarkable they are and how the fact is so they are a major part of the organic matter of the planet. And therefore it makes total sense that we were, we evolved to have these as part of our diet. And as science has progressed in summary, as we've discussed, it seems important for us to include these into our diet to prime our immune system in a healthy way, challenging it to, to stimulate itself, to optimize our immune system. But on top of that, it's a high fiber food that is low in calories, has, has things like vitamin D that we, we didn't even discuss, a whole host of things that we, you know, there's not enough time to discuss. Other types of B vitamins that are, that are found in it, great for weight loss because it's very filling and is one of those things that you should venture and spend some time incorporating into your diet, primarily at least on a weekly basis, but um, Ideally, you would do it one, once a day if you possibly can. Dan is saying, I started uh, taking a product called Host Defense. Host Defense is Paul Stamets' company, uh, Agaricon, to build up immunity during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Is this safe to take while this crisis is ongoing? I don't see why not. Um, one could go on for hours and hours. There's lots of documentaries on mushrooms that I would highly recommend that all of you, you know, go to Netflix and or... Amazon Prime and type in mushroom and you, it's a rabbit hole of remarkable things that, that you can learn about. I mean, there's one mushroom in Brazil um, that has been found that the people in that area live an enormous, that live a, a very, very long time. They call it the mushroom of immortality. I mean, there is so much more that I haven't even discussed that I would recommend that you spend some time, you know, if it's not, if it's just watching a movie or, or something, but start incorporating these into your diet, and I think you'll you'll see some some really amazing uh, benefits. So uh, thank you all for attending. So next week we'll be discussing um, we'll be discussing what happens to your immune system when you get older. What is going on in that? Why is it that as you get older your immune system isn't functioning as well as it was when you were young? Of course, this is in the news these days because people with COVID were finding obviously that people who are young aren't suffering the same kinds of results that people who are old are getting. And therefore, you know, I mean, it's important for us to understand what's going on and what can be done about that. Uh, Pat is saying host defense makes my Taki capsules. I'm sure they do. Um, however, they might not have the D fraction Again, it's still going to be fine um, for you to take. So no question about that. Barbara is saying 
um, asking if she'll be able to listen to this lecture again because there was so much information. Yes, you'll be getting, it'll be on my YouTube channel always. It's being uh, broadcast live there now. There are actually a couple people who are watching as I, I see now. And you'll also get a link if you, if you got this lecture based on an email, um, you'll also get a link to a replay as well. And I see we had other people who joined us. So um, Patricia and uh, Donna, um, welcome everyone to, to, uh, to, so I'm here every week. Uh, next week, as I said, uh, immune system, aging of the immune system, the science of the aging of the immune system. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system, which I briefly spoke about today and how you can activate the endocannabinoid system without cannabis. There's a whole host of things you can do. And when you activate that, you create an anti-inflammatory effect in your body. And we'll talk about all the benefits of that. Um, that's really, really remarkable science that we'll get into that, that is of practical use. So thank you so much. Uh, for, uh, Shil is asking uh, about frozen mushrooms. I, I think they should be fine. Um, I haven't seen frozen mushrooms that much, but um, they should be fine. Frozen mushrooms should be fine. Any other questions? All right, well, again, thank you so much for your attention. I really love the fact that almost pretty much everyone who started the lecture tonight is still here on the Zoom call. And we've got a couple people watching on uh, Instagram and a couple people watching on YouTube. And I look forward to being with you again next week or well, next Wednesday, every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. This is one of the highlights of my week to be talking to all of you and uh, hearing your great questions. Thank you so much and have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again for your attention. Bye-bye.